don't have any apologies I think, to the no, no. members who are going to be coming in by Starley. So um, Ms Kelly has indicated that she will be a little bit late. Um, moving then to Chair's business, just to advise that officials are not in a position to provide members with further detail on joinery monitoring, as the Minister is still considering the detail of that. Um, and also in addition, at last week's meeting, the committee requested that officials attend um, this session in order to brief the committee on the need for uh, a mitigation scheme for taxi operators. And obviously during the meeting we had been given, we were, it was indicated that officials would be available and that, that has since changed. Um, but the minister has declined to approve um, that briefing. Um, just with regards then to the monitoring round, um, the mon I understand that the Minister is failing to comply with the monitoring round guidance which was issued earlier in the year by the Department of Finance. The guidance states that departments must ensure that they engage fully with their assembly committees in respect of the in-year monitoring process and the extent and timing is a matter for committees, not for departments. Now, the committee um, has given reasonable notice to the department with regards to that. Um, we requested the briefing on the 3rd of November. So therefore, really, the Minister doesn't have a great excuse for not providing the information. And I other, understand that other committees have been in receipt of this. Um, some have. Some, some have been in, are, in, are, in, are in receipt of it. So if members are content, we, we write to the Minister to ask for a full explanation as to why the guidance hasn't been followed and request an undertaking that this doesn't happen. In, in the future. Um, obviously, we were offered an opportunity to discuss October monitoring round since that has passed, and we would, be, we would have had no new information. It would have been essentially a waste of time um, for the committee. And if you're also content that we write to the Committee for Finance just to inform it that the department has not complied with the guidance, if you're content to do that. Indeed. Yeah. I think it's part of that correspondence probably will be included, but it's to sort of understand why this information didn't, wasn't received today and why we're getting it in January, because there might be reasons for that. So it would be good to understand that. Our understanding is that she just wanted further time just to look at it. Importantly, guess, ask for that. Um, now, obviously, that means that we've had to, we've, we have had we've had two gaps in our, in our business today um, in relation to taxi operators um, from the officials and also um, the the briefing for monitoring round, um, which which really isn't good for us planning our committee sessions because we have been tight with time, and we've had to send um, others away at various times because we've overran because we are restricted in our time slot here, and we had given, um, particularly given the importance of January monitoring, we had allocated um, a slot and that was very sort of late in the day and getting that notification. Um, so I'm not really sure that this, that's how we want this committee to, to run and if members are content that we put out a, a statement to, to that effect. So if um, Jonathan, do you have a copy of it? I'll just we'll table that for, for members to, to see. Obviously this was drafted, this was drafted by the um, comms team. Just in advance, Mr Hildage. Chair, just in your, in your bundle of information there in relation to what Thank was you, to happen between last week and this week, I had raised concerns at last week's committee meeting in relation to the very small uptake of the taxi drivers fund. I think there was something like only about 50 or 60 per cent. It suggested that we would break to the Minister uh, asking for a small window potentially because of the, the reasons for the low uptake. Uh, and I think most of the committee then felt, no, we'll wait to today uh, and raise it today. And there's a week gone on taxi drivers who, who missed that deadline of the 27th of November are no, are no further on then in relation to that as individuals. Well, certainly last week we felt that there was a matter of urgency around all of this, these issues, particularly with regards to the criteria which had been set and the issues around insurance. Um, 
as you say, the, the low uptake and also the, the issues that are that pertain to the taxi operators themselves as well and the very um, real issues that they, they are facing and the consequences of closure of those businesses will have then on drivers too. So and if that's why we were keen then to have this this discussion then today um, with officials. And I think it would be I think we do need to to write with urgency to the minister. We were mindful of the fact that any response then wouldn't actually then be scrutinised until until January, and, and that's just um, the reality of the situation that we find ourselves in today in, in the timing of all of this, that we now have um, folk who are moving <coughs> into Christmas, and there was an expectation, obviously, that they would receive some sort of assistance, um, and while that's, that's a small amount of money, that doesn't seem to be materialising either for them. Um, welcome some comments, Mr Boylan and Ms Anderson. Th yeah, thank you, Chair. I mean... Obviously, sure, it's not, it's not acceptable, because I mean this is a matter of urgency, and, and like people have said, I mean besides the sixty percent that is applied for it out of the nine thousand, there's thirty percent of those. There's a question mark over now whether they'll receive any money at all, and I mean this is our last meeting, mouth of Christmas. We we as a committee have have interrogated this over a number of weeks now from this scheme started, and this is right across the board. You mentioned the operators. And it's right across the industry now that they need support, and they have done from March. And I appreciate we we will we will send out some press today, and we will speak on behalf of the committee, and that I'm fully supportive of that. But I have to say that it's not acceptable that there's nobody here to answer the questions on behalf of the taxi industry. <coughs> I understand that part of the reasoning was that obviously they're trying within the department to get as many payments out as possible. There's an issue and a flaw the way we see it, within the criteria. That's the major question that we need an answer. Not the question of those people who should have been established now after five or six weeks that were entitled to this money, because it's clearly been the criteria. It's the people who are not, and obviously the operators who were in last week. So I don't think it's, it's acceptable. It's not good for us. It's not a good relationship with the department ourselves and the minister. So, you know, we have very limited time now, but only a week, to try and get something out before Christmas, and I don't. You know, I'm not not content with that, with the answers that the minister and the department has come back with. Ms. Anderson, the chair, I think the cavalier attitude that we've had from the department and the minister uh, with regards to the criteria that was set up, we have done everything possible to appeal to the minister, to send testimonies to the minister, to try to get the criteria changed. Um, I think that the um, the criteria that had been set up in excluding those who had temporarily suspended their insurance, and we all know people who have done that and why, and there's no point in recounting some of the testimonies that we did so uh, last week. I'm glad to hear that maybe we'll have a joint statement, perhaps from, could we have a joint statement, uh, is that what you're suggesting, from the committee? Um, or can I suggest that we could have a joint statement? There's a statement that's been, um, that just been circulated. Yeah, well, that, that was in relation to the monitoring room it's briefing. No, it's both. Both, both. Oh, <coughs> both as well, okay. Um, so I think that uh, I would definitely, like Cahill, we'd give our approval uh, to that. But this is our last committee. And we waited, as David has said, we waited a week uh, in the hope that the, um, the officials would come in front of us. And... I can I can say with almost certainty that most MLAs, the stories that we're hearing, like there was a taxi driver a few nights ago, had to uh, get assistance from from friends and colleagues because he was going to take his life. That's the seriousness of the situation, the mental health pressure that these drivers are under as a consequence of criteria that has excluded them, and we cannot ignore that. So I don't know what else we can do. I'm hoping that the minister will find it in herself to go back at this late stage and review the uh, criteria that was established that excluded those taxi drivers who temporarily, as we know, um, stopped their insurance for some of them only a few weeks or longer so that they could put food on the table and help their families during this pandemic. This is supposed to be a hardship fund. The clue is in the word, and yet those drivers that are excluded for the reasons that we would all understand if we were faced with the same circumstances. I'm sure every one of us would have done the same. 
So I'm glad that statement has gone out. Sorry, I didn't get a chance to realise it was on both on both issues. Um, but is there anything else at this late stage that we can do? Is there any representation that we can try and make to the department today? Is there anything that we can do? I know you facilitated a, a Zoom the last time you, know, you, you, you brought forward some action. Is there anything that we can do before we leave here in the last committee uh, in the mouth of Christmas and these drivers not being supported? Okay, Mr Beggs. <coughs> With regard to not getting a briefing on the uh, priorities in the monitoring round, and it's very clear that that's a role that the committee has to be consulted on, uh, so it's disappointing that that's not been facilitated, and I haven't seen a, uh, what I consider to be a reasonable explanation why it hasn't, hasn't happened. Uh, I mean, things do happen, and sometimes there, there might be a vi viable reason for it, but I haven't, haven't seen it. Um, I think also with regard to your concern for the many who have been excluded from the uh, taxi driver support by the criteria, um, um, I think there does need to be ongoing uh, engagement. Again, uh, disappointed that no one is here today. We're not asking that, that uh, we need half a dozen officials, but I would have thought uh, an engagement should continue on this issue. Uh, there is the balance um, between what the department is doing. Uh, and, and the, what I consider to be uh, unreasonable effect. They, they are relying on uh, the potential for fraud if someone had a, a gap in their service. Certainly, if someone had a gap on their service uh, which excluded the lockdown period, uh, or a, a wider period, um, uh, there, there, would, there may be a question. But if we're talking about a relatively short gap uh, uh, during that complete shutdown period, I think it's not unreasonable that those people should be uh, uh, supported uh, if they still have then uh, reverted to continuing tax and insurance. Um, so I think that engagement needs to continue. Uh, as to what we can do now, I think we, we have to actually perhaps ask that the, the chair make contact with the minister or the minister's office to try and engage on a one-to-one -one basis because we have a committee are unable to do so. Perhaps we would be right to ask you to um, directly pass our frustration in how this matter is being uh, developed rather than just rely on a, a, a written correspondence. Uh, so I would hope that uh, that's something you might be able to uh, uh, gain some access and to pass on directly to the minister or her um, personal office or private office in the next few days. Yeah. Of course, I have spoken to the Minister on a number of occasions in relation to this, but, um, and obviously then there were questions put to her in the Chamber yesterday during topicals, um, and it was the same response that we've heard over the last number of weeks, so there has been very little change in that, but certainly um, content to follow up on that, Mr. Yeah. I'd agree with some of the comments from Roy. I've said in the piece around the, the monitoring round, obviously be interested in the reasons why it didn't come here today, but in relation to the taxi drivers, I think it's disappointing we're not having officials here. We don't need to cast thousands. You know, we even have had one official here to be able to engage with. Um, but we do want to be able to continue to have good relations with our department and with our minister, because that's how productive relations come out of that. And what Roy said in terms of yourself and the minister making contact, I think, would be a productive way forward. Otherwise, we're going to be sitting with correspondence going backwards and forwards and no progress in relation to this. And I don't think that's in anyone's interest. I don't think there's anything that we're asking for which is should could be deemed to be unreasonable um, at all. Um, but obviously there is a commitment for them to come up in January, but that's that's a number of weeks away, um, and there's obviously an expectation that it could, should have been sorted in, in advance of Christmas, given the fact that a request for a scheme has been um, debated and discussed in this in this house for um, several months. This hasn't come to that. Mr Buchanan. Yeah, thank you, Chair. See the press release, obviously it's discussing monitoring around and taxi operators cannot be widened out to cover cannot be changed at this stage or broadened out to cover the restrictions, you know, on the insurance part of it, you know, purely for taxi. Well, I suppose really for us today it was the fact that we didn't have officials yeah. um, rather than getting into the detail of of that. Okay. Mrs. Anderson. On that point, because it, it, it does say, Keith, um, a briefing to the committee by the taxi operators on 9th of December, which highlighted the lack of support for their sector. So that would include, I'm assuming, in that what we're talking about is the drivers and the insurance and, the and all of the issues, uh, as well as the operators. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, Member Skinner. Sure, I mean, Chair, sure, I appreciate, appreciate the statement. And the, the issue for us is this. Um, there's no doubt officials will be listening to the meeting. And there was a series of questions. There's a series of questions that has been asked yesterday evening in the chamber. The point for us now, where we as a committee have to ask ourselves exactly, we will put out the statement, but exactly what can we do now? Like this is the midnight hour for us in terms of scrutiny role as a committee, because we're out of here after today. So, like I say, this this conversation will be listened to, and, and rightly so, because it's a live public session. What realistically can we do? And I, I mean, other than asking yourself on behalf of the committee to represent us, if there's an opportunity for you to speak to the minister over the next two days, if you can, I would certainly support that. And obviously, relay as much as we can to try and get a resolve, in particular, to supporting some of those in the taxi industry in the run up to Christmas. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kelly. Later, I had trouble joining, and I have to leave my car in to get service for MOT of all things. <laughs> so um, I'm just picking up on some of the issues that you've been discussing. I suppose uh, in relation to the January monitoring round, I want to be recorded as um, uh, not supporting uh, the statement and criticising because I understand the January monitoring January monitoring round submission isn't due until the fourth of January. So really, it doesn't make sense. Uh, to me, this particular course of action on the issue around uh, the taxi operators and taxi driver scheme. I think the minister made it very clear yesterday that she only got power a, a matter of weeks ago where it had actually been with the economy minister from March. And furthermore, um, I think we should be supporting the infrastructure minister in asking for the economy minister to reconsider um, including uh, taxi drivers and taxi operators in Part B of the current COVID restrictions. And uh, the, um, the, the, I don't know whether or not uh, we should seek legal advice because that seems to be some of the rationale in terms of the audit advice which the ministers received in terms of wh where some of the constraints are uh, in relation to the financial assistance package, which, which is actually... Uh, uh, as I think the finance minister said, to support exceptional circumstances which taxi drivers find themselves in around overhead costs where the, the rates relief uh, didn't apply because they didn't have a premise. It was not, uh, as we know, uh, to um, um, su supplement a loss of income because that falls back to the economy. So I just think, uh, I don't think it's fair if we give uh, the wrong information out to people and, and play politics with this. Uh, whenever we know uh, that there are certain constraints around some of the programmes uh, that are uh, available and, and some of the constraints that the Minister has to operate in and what are exceptional circumstances and not normally uh, a grant given power, uh, uh, as you know, varies, had to be given to her by the TEO back at the end of October, early November. So um, I, I just want to put that on record. Um, I think it's, it's right and appropriate that we give people factual information. So we know that the Minister applied for the exceptional circumstances for the Financial Assistance um, Act to be transferred to her on the 23rd of October. We know that the TEO committee responded, the two Ministers responded on the 24th, the next day. So yeah. we, we, we also know that the exceptional circumstances uh, that uh, afford the Minister to get the, um, the Financial uh, Assistance Act transferred to her, as is the case for any Minister, it's, it's there for any Minister who has exceptional circumstances. For those taxi drivers who suspended their insurance, the exceptional circumstances apply to them. Because the PPE, they still had to pay for it once they became active again as taxi drivers. They have a taxi policy uh, and the, the DVLA recognise them as designated taxi drivers. So the exceptional circumstances apply to them. And there were no reasons why, when they were setting up the criteria, which the department did, 
that they excluded those taxi drivers that suspended their insurance. That has been the appeal, and that has been the cross-party appeal of all of the members of this committee, is to ask the officials, and that is why we wanted the officials in front of us today, who put an exclusion in the criteria that excluded those drivers who temporarily um, suspended their insurance. And that is what we are asking, and that is what we are asking the Minister, and the Minister has the power to look at the criteria set by her department and to change it. Um, uh, Chair, I, I'm not quibbling about the, those taxi drivers who suspended their insurance because they did what anybody would do whenever you have financial um, shortfalls. You look at where you can cut some of your overheads. I, I absolutely get that. And yes, I do think we, we need uh, some clarification on But the Minister has been quite adamant uh, uh, in the audit office and the advice available to her in relation to that. And yes, I would like to hear uh, that uh, again from officials, so I have no quibble with that aspect of it. Okay, uh, just in relation to, you obviously missed the first part of the, of the session. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. And yeah. Was, with regards to the monitoring round, we have received advice uh, and guidance um, in relation to in-year monitoring, which came from the Department of Finance. And it says that assembly committees have an important role to play in the scrutiny of departmental spending plans. For that reason, departments must ensure that they, fo they engage fully with their assembly committees in respect of the in-year monitoring process. The extent and timing of this engagement is obviously a matter for individual committees, and there should be early engagement with committees in order to establish their requirements. The EOF recommends that committees should be kept informed of financial matters on an ongoing basis. And the request for this meeting and this briefing um, went to the department at, on the 3rd of November, which was, which was timely notice. And at the very mm. last moment, within the last um, sort of two days, it was yesterday, yesterday morning, yesterday morning um, we was received um, communication from the department to say that they wouldn't be briefing us. So I don't think that is acceptable. Um, and I think that they should have had a conversation with us in advance of that. We have um, a lot to discuss in this committee, as you appreciate. We have been restricted mm -hmm. in our time, and for to give us such short notice wasn't acceptable, and certainly isn't for the running of the committee. So that's hence the reason for the statement today. And we will communicate with the minister to say that we aren't content with that, because we do want. It's much better for us to have a good working relationship with the department and the minister, but that has to work both ways. I accept that. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Members content? Yep. Agreed. Oh, is the press release agreed? Obviously, agreed. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. Mrs. Agreed. Kelly. Okay. Thank you very much. And Minister, or sorry, Minister. Chair, are you are you going to try again? Yes, I will. Communicate yeah. with the minister and give her a few of the. But I do think that we, that we also need to to write to the minister um, yeah, to to detail the concerns that we have in relation to the scheme, and we also need to reiterate the issues from last week's meeting with regards to the operators who have been excluded from any assistance um, pertaining to um, yeah. why they operate Agreed. their business and, the, and the, the exceptional circumstances as they relayed them to us um, last week. So if members are content that we do that. Yeah. Agreed, yeah. Chair. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. um, just at the end of last week's meeting, there was a suggestion that um, the, the, the chair could table a um, an urgent oral on behalf of the committee. That's not procedurally correct, and we can't do that. Um, so it must be tabled by an individual MLA. Okay. Um, also advise you that there is a photo opportunity with TransLink and the new hydrogen buses following the conclusion of the meeting down in the apron. So we may want to go down there as a, as a committee um, to get that. Oh, and obviously, you can get individual photographs if you wish to do that. So we can do that at the end. Moving then to item four, which is our draft minutes at page 16. That's for the meeting of the 9th of December. Are members content to agree? Really? Moving then to item five, which is matters arising at page 23. And again, that's from the meeting of the 9th of December. Members have any issues in relation to, we've, we have discussed probably quite at length, um, some of the issues arising from last week. Okay, moving then to page 27, and that's outstanding committee requests for information. And then at page um, 43, we have correspondence from the Minister regarding the committee's request 
for a briefing by officials on financial support for taxi operators, and we have discussed that at reasonable length. Moving then to correspondence, uh, just draw your attention to the correspondence memo at page 46 and tabled again at or tabled at page 7. Members have anything they would wish to highlight? At page 57, we do have correspondence from the bus and coach um, limited regarding concerns in relation to the financial support scheme um, for uh, bus and coach operators. Members have any comments in relation to that? They have requested to to meet with us. Yep. So um, are members of the opinion that we schedule that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Support that. Yeah. I think there is that there may be another um, coach operators. Yeah, Cody. Yeah. Cody. Yeah. So we may want to include them. Yep. In yes. in that as well. Okay. Okay. Any other items for correspondence that members are concerned about or wish to discuss? Okay, we move then. Page 60 is the examiner's statutory rules, 16th report of the session 2020 to 2021, with SR 2020 282, which is the bus operator coronavirus financial assistance regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. Um, the department has acknowledged in correspondence that the regulations were laid in breach of the 21 day rule and has explained the reason for the breach, which has occurred in the context of the department's urgent response to the coronavirus pandemic. The examiner is content that the department has on this occasion provided a satisfactory reason um, for the breach. And at page 73, with correspondence from the Committee for Justice requesting any views or comments the committee may wish to provide on any aspects of the bill um, which is relevant to our remit and responsibilities. Um, I'm not sure, is there anyone here from, from the Justice Committee? Um, I'm not sure, um, Cathy, you have looked at this. Do you believe there's anything? It, I, don't, I don't think there's anything relevant for this committee. Okay, so remember that was in relation to the criminal justice committal reform bill. So if members are content, then we just um, we go back with really a no return on that. Yep. Okay. Um, tabled at page 10, we have response uh, from the minister to issues arising from the committee meeting, and that was on the, the 25th of uh, November. If members have anything they wish to raise um, from that. No. Nope. Okay. Thank you. So, members, are, um, if you're content, then that the actions are as suggested in the memo. Um, if you're, and it'll be agreed unless you indicated otherwise, which you haven't. So, be enough with that. Moving then to um, item seven, which is subordinate legislation SL ones, uh, not subject to uh, assembly proceedings. At page eighty-seven. SL1, the, the prohibition of waiting schools order, Northern Ireland 2020. The proposals are not subject to assembly proceedings. The rule will prohibit vehicles waiting outside a number of schools at the start and end of the school day. Are members content with the proposals? Right. Yep. Okay, and hopefully this will assist with some safety issues Maybe. around yeah. schools. Yeah. Item eight. Subordinate legislation SRs not subject to proceedings. There are five um, statutory rules not subject to assembly proceedings, and a list of those are at page 90 of your pack. And the rules are included in the pages from page 91 to 111, and I'm just going to take them on bulk. So if members are content with all five, or if you have yeah. any issues? If you just great, great. Great. great, great, thank you. Um, moving then to item nine, which is SR 2020 300, the planning, environmental assessments, and technical miscellaneous amendments, EU exit regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and that's at page 113. Uh, the committee considered the proposal for the rule on the 2nd of December. We were content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. Um, we do have um, Brian Gorman and Ronan McCrory from Planning Policy Division on Starleaf. Yeah. Do we? 
minute. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so, um, Brian and Ronan, you're very welcome to the committee this morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, if, you just you, like, if you'd like just to speak Thank to you, us, Jack. if you can hear us. Yep. Okay, if you would like to, to just to speak to this SR, it would be quite useful just for the committee. Well, it's essentially just a follow-up from the UK SI in 2018, which dealt with planning and operables with the EU exit. So from 2018 to 2020, we've picked up a few minor technical issues, which we wanted to resolve by putting this SR through so that everything's operable and legally certain post uh, IP completion day on the 31st of December. Okay, obviously the, the committee have raised issues in relation to the sort of um, catch-all technical issues um, term, which has been used in the department. Um, could you be a bit Bit more specific with regards to what that is? Well, for example, um, uh, since uh, 2018, there has been amending directives put forward through the EU. So really, we just want to capture those. So we're making, uh, a, we're using, for instance, uh, implementing a term uh, as it has effect immediately before IP completion day just to ensure that we capture all amending directives from the 2018 SI, things of that nature. I can give you another example if you wish. Well, that would be useful. Um, there was also uh, references to directives that are now um, have been superseded. Uh, we wish to remove them there from some of the transposing um, directives, for example, the management of waste from extractive industries. Two directives there have now been superseded, so we want to remove those from that from that um, planning legislation. Okay, thank you, um, Miss Anderson. Um, it's good to get the explanation of the um, the technical um, arrangements that they're saying they need to change because we didn't really get that before. So I have found that helpful. Uh, what Brian said, because when we made uh, when we give our approval to SRs in the past. We then had the legal advice that came back and told us that you cannot make domestic law change the EU law, and that's, that doesn't seem to be happening here. So I think the catch-all phrase, as you say, um, is good to have the explanation. I can understand what's been said here because particularly if you have directives that have been superseded and then you have directives that we need to catch up with, but particularly around plan, we need to make sure we have legal certainty going forward. Okay, thank you. Mr Beggs. Um, I'm just curious why we must uh, have implemented every directive uh, before we leave, because uh, we're leaving, it's up to us if we think it's good law or bad law, and EU will not have a power to impose fines as they would have in the past. So, what's the thinking behind implementing all EU law before we leave? I'm sorry, uh, Chair, I think Ronan has lost his connection there. Um, I apologize just thought I lost my connection. Um, okay, sorry well, about that. I'll allow Mr. Beggs to repeat himself. Uh, right, right, Mr. Beggs. <laughs> On this one occasion. <laughs> you've, indicated, that. You're, you've indicated that you're keen to uh, update any minor uh, or any issue involving EU directives into our law before we leave. It's almost a bit of a panic. We must have it done before we leave. But in the past, if our legislation was not in line with the directive, uh, eventually the EU would give us uh, a warning, you have to introduce this or you'll get a fine. Surely that will not be possible after the 1st of, of January. It will be simply up to us to decide is this a good thing or a bad thing. So I'm trying to understand the thinking behind uh, uh, at the last minute making these minor technical adjustments when there should not be any bearing afterwards. What's the thinking of, of doing this? Well, um, on the 31st of December, um, we'll, we'll lose the Section 22 part to deal with any EU um, issues. And it was really just um, a tidy up exercise, most of all, to make sure that we have everything in place on the 31st of December to ensure that we reflect the EU regulations and directives on that date so that we can then look at that post um, leaving the EU. 
We just wanted everything to be up to date as much as possible on leaving before we lose the 2 2 powers under the European Community Act 1972. Sorry, what are the 2 2 powers? I, I, I'm not familiar. Well, to um, transpose European legislation, European directives. But surely, any of the changes that you're proposing, we could uh, put in our law after. Uh, uh, after the 1st of January, what, what would stop us deciding if we want to adopt some, some uh, method of doing something that was similar to Europe? Well, we, we will need um, different powers. We will need the powers to be able to utilize or to transpose European regulations. Now, we can um, take them on board if we so wish um, and, and use them on their different frameworks and that there, but it was just thought um, prudent to get everything as much up to date as possible before exit day. And, and, and finally, Anna, is there any difference between the approach that we are using and the approach being adopted uh, in other devolved regions? Um, not, that, not that I'm aware of. Um, as you know, the 2018 SI went through DEFRA. Um, so it was akin to what they were doing in relation to inoperables. And all we've tended to do with this here SR is to bring things up to date as much as possible. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, Boylan. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Brian, just just take it back a bit. I mean, you, you mentioned there obviously the issue of the twenty two. That's because of the the operation dates. You have to have that in time. Is that is that my understanding of it? Yeah. That's correct. We'll lose those powers on the thirty first of December. That's my understanding of it. Sound. And let's, let's take it back, because Mr Beggs has asked an interesting question, because I brought this up before in committee. See, because we are transposing from Europe to responsibility, which is technical to the departments, which is grand, and most would, would agree with those things, because that has to be done. The, the issue is the content and what we want to bring forward. Cause, so clearly you're saying those SIs, we are just transposing them. But most of them, if not all of them, should be only on a technical matter in terms of their start dates and also in terms of transposing responsibility from Europe to the Department. Is that correct? Yes, we're not changing any policy no, that was uh, originally there. Because that's the important thing for us. The important thing is because we may, we may agree with some elements of European policy regulation. We may want to change it. We may want to adopt it. But for now, what your exercise is is only transposing the technical arrangements in terms of responsibility to the department and also the time frames that you can operate. Is that correct? That's correct. And post and post uh, uh, exit day, then the opportunity will be there for any UK jurisdiction to amend that as they see fit, or to introduce other elements of EU law that's introduced after exit day. That will be an option. Okay, no, that, that's, that's only seeking clarification. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? Any queries in relation to this? No? Okay, thank you very much um, to both of you. Um, thanks, Brian and Rowan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, um, are you content with what you've heard? Do members have any issues in relation to this? Sure, we're, we're, con we're content for now, but it's like my colleague has raised. I mean, if there comes an issue up over a ruling in January, like because that's the final date. Okay. So, you know, so. so members content. Okay. okay. So the committee for infrastructure has considered SR 2020-300, the planning, environmental assessments, and technical miscellaneous amendments, EU exit regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Great. Moving then to item 10 which is SL1, the regulation EC number uh, 1370, 2007, public services obligations in transport, revocation, EU exit, Northern Ireland regulations 2020. And you'll find the SL1 at page 124 of your packs. And also tabled at page 43 is ministerial correspondence um, regarding the committee. Uh, committee consideration of the SL1 
but obviously the minister is ur is urging us to, to move forward with um, this SL1. So if we can welcome Linda McHugh, the acting deputy secretary of Resources, Governance and EU, and Bernie Rooney, the director Gateways and EU Relations, and Graham Banks to, from Gateways and EU Relations, you're all very welcome. To the Thank committee. You. Obviously, um, Graham was with us last week in relation to this, and members had raised concerns as to um, basically where we sat with all of this, and obviously the fact that you had received um, contradictory legal advice, hence why we were in this position. So, uh, Linda, do you want yep. to lead on this? It would be yep. useful just for, to hear from you. Okay, so Chair, committee members, thank you for the opportunity to come back today for further consideration of the SL1, the regulation EC number 1370-2007, Public Service Obligations and Transport Amendment, EU Exit, Northern Ireland, Revocation Regulations 2020. Um, and as you said, I'm joined by, by my colleagues here today. Um, so after the meeting last week, the Minister wrote to you to respond in detail on the points raised at the meeting last week. And I want to add my own apology um, that the committee is being asked now to consider revoking regulations that it was only recently asked to approve. Um, as I'm sure you will understand, exiting the, e the European Union represents a novel challenge when developing legislation, particularly when it intersects with both international law with respect to the withdraw withdrawal agreement and the Northern Ireland Protocol. This is made more complex when the implementation of, of the withdrawal agreement and the Northern Ireland Protocol is subject to further agreements between the UK Government and the European Union. The ongoing negotiations are being closely monitored to ensure that the Department can take the appropriate steps to align our legislation with the outcomes of the negotiation once they are known. Meanwhile, we must work to regularise the legislation we have. And as a result of the inclusion of the regulation in question in the Northern Ireland Protocol, it will effectively now appear twice in the statute book unless it's revoked. This is not about changing policy, but about ensuring clarity in reading the statute book and dealing with what would be a duplication. That's why the regulation should be revoked. Following last week's committee, the Department has reviewed its EU exit legislation, which it's already made, and the legal advice on which it was based. And I want to reassure the committee that the rest of the Department's EU exit legislation is properly made and based on sound legal advice. The proposed revoking leg uh, regulations are the only set which are required to correct the error in the Department's statute book, book as I've already discussed or described. I appreciate that committee members may have further questions and we'll be happy to take those if you have any further questions on this. Okay. Um, I suppose really just from the outset, I suppose you will appreciate the concerns that the committee had yes. with regards to that, the fact that it did come to us for scrutiny. Uh, and it's not that we took it necessarily in good faith, but mm -hmm. obviously it was based on the advice that was coming from the department that we were making the decisions that we made. And it, it meant that we did need to feel, we, we felt that we needed the extra time in order to um, get a satisfactory explanation mm. uh, and also to obviously um, receive advice with regards to where the committee stands with all of these things, particularly in our role as, um, as scrutinisers. Mm. Um, so, I mean, that, that it's useful that you've, you've come here today and obviously um, the minister is, is, has sort of re-emphasised the need for this to be done at the earliest opportunity. Uh, so in the event of this n not having been agreed, what are the consequences? Well, the consequences are that, that we'll have one set of regulations made and also um, there will be in the Northern Ireland Protocol. So it's, it's basically a duplication of the legislative um, uh, cover. So, I mean, it, it'll be a, a bit messy in terms of the statute book, but it won't have a direct effect on, on how the department operates in terms of these regulations. Um, but it, it is something that would need tidied. It's, it's a tidying up exercise because effectively they're in now twice, covered in the protocol and separately in, in their own right. Um, and I suppose it, it was um, you know, what, what the legal advice, I suppose, um, didn't pick up was that they were enshrined in the protocol itself. And that's where the duplication has, has occurred. 
Um, so that's effectively where we are now. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and you're welcome back, Linda. Thank you. We knew this was all going to be a problem for the whole lot of us, <laughs> and I mean, I, I have some concerns. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it, and I keep raising this at committee because, besides, because the, the legal system is a minefield in its own right. So with EU laws, we have our own laws, and everything in between. Mm -hmm. And basically, what we're trying to do, whatever policy changes that we think fit, as from this committee's point of view, we have a responsibility to get that right yeah. and work for ourselves. Just a couple of points. Say in terms of the protocol, then, because then it was duplication. It has primacy, then. Yes, it would have. You know, no matter what, right across the board, it should mm -hmm. have primacy. Mm -hmm. It does. So this was a duplication. Okay. Yes. So, so my, my main question is, um, and I appreciate we're all tiptoe through it. Um, everybody said with that same frame. I understand how difficult it's been for mm -hmm. collectively, but at the end of this process, we need to make sure we have got it right mm -hmm. in, part, in terms of our scrutiny role yes. and what we do as a committee. Um, so, my question would be, um, in terms of other EU regs mm -hmm. coming forward, mm -hmm. where have any insight into where we're at with them and any complications because I would be very concerned. Yeah. I appreciate because you know you got one legal opinion then you got another legal opinion, you know, you've explained it's a duplication. That sounds like a simplification of it. But we all know any of us know the legal system is a legal system. And you know, for every opinion is an opposite. Mm -hmm. That's so I, I'm just as as a committee member, um of, of, a, of a role here, scrutiny, and like all the rest of us, and I, w I would be slightly concerned about how we go about that. So, yeah. just in terms of others and, and what what we may face in the future. Yeah, I mean, I suppose I have given you reassurance that everything that we've made to date is correct as the law stands now. Um, what we will have to very closely monitor um, from now on is, as and when there is any form of an agreement, um, will that actually? change what we've already made um, but we don't know that yet um, so I can't say to you with a high degree of confidence that we might not need to come back and make new new regulations um, depending on how the negotiations turn out um, and um, you know what the position is in terms of our relationship with the EU um, and and the, the implications of the protocol no, I appreciate it, and that's, that's the complication in all that. That will be a complication. There's, and, there's, and no, there's no two ways about that. Yeah. And besides our east west links, our north south links, we've got to get this right. We've got to get it right, and, 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 and we will be closely monitoring. Whatever is it, with the protocol, there may be the issues you said as primacy. So, all I'm saying to you from, a, from our own point of view, from a committee point of view, uh, that has primacy. There is things going to be questionable for this committee going forward. Mm -hmm. And the earlier we see it as a committee, the earlier we get a chance to look at it. Yeah. We may need our own legal advice as a committee as well at some point. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I mean, that's that's some of the complications yeah. we have, and challenges yeah. we will face in the future. And as officials, we really need to wait for the outcome of the negotiation, whatever that is, and then reflect on that. Um, and you know, we've already started to think about how we put in monitor a monitoring process um, to make sure that anything that we have done is still valid. Along with best practices and Absolutely. all that goes with it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay, thank chair, you, thank you. Um, yeah. Ms. Anderson. And uh, Brexit is messy, and despite all our different uh, opinions about it, you know, you are in a you are in a difficult situation. But it is important to uh, to give certainty and to avoid doubt, and that was something that this committee has tried mm. to do throughout this process, because we knew. Uh, when we were challenging the officials that were in front of us, when we were discussing SRs that were incompatible with the protocol, that there was something not right. And we were given assurance that it was OK, that it was only technical. And then we had different legal advice, or you had different legal advice. So did the committee play a part even in enabling you to probe that further? Because it would enable us to feel that at least our scrutiny role, despite the various opinions on Brexit, we were doing as much as we could mm -hmm. at the time that the previous SR that we gave approval for, that we have now had to or been suggested we should remove. 
It, it came to light actually when we were looking into a separate matter, um, and um, it was uh, it was our legal advisor um, who said actually, now that we look at this again, there is a um, a duplication here which needs to be sorted out. Mm. Well, that might suggest to officials, not to yourselves, but others who are coming in front of us, mm -hmm. that they might listen to us. Yeah. Because we realised that there was mm -hmm. something not right when we were being asked to bring forward law or to approve an SR when it was in the protocol. And this all seemed a bit messy because it wasn't being compatible with what we were being told what could happen. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you have cleared that up, so where would suggest that the officials may take account because you know we do know what we're talking about at times when we are scrutinising the officials. So are we satisfied now based on what you've said and the checks that have obviously been done at your end mm -hmm. from where you're at now? Mm -hmm. I appreciate we don't know what's going to happen in 15 days time on a future relationship. But as we sit here today, all of the SRs, everything is compatible mm -hmm. with the protocol and there's going to be no other emergency meetings or presentations to us to say, well, you should give approval to something that was technically incorrect. Mm -hmm. That is the assurance that I can give you today. Okay. We've, we've looked through that with the SO. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much. Um, reading through all of this, and it takes a few hours to get yourself on top of this, I went through the, the protocol, it's quite mm -hmm. an extensive document, and just the concern I have, and I don't know whether you can address this, is obviously there's there's a view here that there's two different legal opinions, and the second legal opinions came back. But from reading the protocol, and I'm not a lawyer, you know this should have been clear if you were going through the protocol and picking through that elements that this was not, you know, this shouldn't have been moved, mm -hmm. um, because we were able to go through it and find those elements. So I'm not sure, you know, I need assurance here that you're fully on top of the protocol and what it involves. We debate about the protocol and the. the whether you're for or against is another matter. We need to remain lawful. We need to mm -hmm. remain, and I just need to get that assurance that people are on top of the protocol. Yeah, and you know, I, th I think part of the difficulty with this is, is also the speed with which things were required to be done, um, and it is unfortunate that this was overlooked, um, and it, it was an error. Um, and as I said, I've apologised for that. Um, uh, but clearly, we will be. Um, looking at this in, in a lot more detail for anything that we do in the future um, and overlaying the, the requirements of the protocol with anything that we do. Um, we're just commencing a detailed analysis of the protocol. Um, work just commenced yesterday just to be sure to go through and, and check the protocol against um, what, what we have. Yes, I, I'm just new to post. so. Um, <laughs> Just want to make sure that I fully understand it, and uh, and, and actually the committee's views were helpful last week for me coming new to this, um, just to make sure that we do listen and, and double check everything. Um, so, yeah, we're, we just started yesterday a detailed analysis of uh, the implications and the impact of the the current information is available. Thank you. It's helpful. Ms. Cummins. Sorry, Chair, my question has been answered there. Okay, thank you. Mr. Beggs? Um, you've, you've, you've talked about the, the duplication between the legislation that we have and the protocol. I uh, understand that um, much of what happens can be determined by decisions of the Joint Committee, and in fact, the decisions of the two Joint Chairmen of the Joint Committee, committee who can then say what must happen. Now, personally, I think that is an affront to democracy that two joint committee persons can determine what legislation must be in, in place here in Northern Ireland. And we are succumbing from our legislative process to the two man junta system. So I, I uh, much prefer that the Assembly would determine what legislation operates in Northern Ireland than the, the two man junta system. So, can they, if there's duplication, can the uh, protocol not be adjusted? Well, I think that's beyond me. Um, you know, the, the, the protocol is yeah. an international agreement. Um, and I mean, that, as sorry, civil servants, we that is, that is my thinking. My thinking is the protocol is wrong, and it is what should be adjusting rather than our legislation. Okay, and have you any questions in relation to what we're being presented with at the moment? 
other than I would, would oppose uh, that we simply do it because it's in the protocol, which is determined by uh, you know, the, the joint committee and all of that. Okay, and I think we do, we do appreciate actually the complexity of all of this, but I suppose really as we're moving forward, I suppose we have to move forward in some sort of confidence that the information that we receive from you and the advice that we're getting um, is, is accurate. Yes. Um, so, and that's not necessarily telling you all, but that's just, no, 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 it's I, just I, that, we should be, that we should be able to work together in that yeah. confidence, because obviously we don't have the capacity as a committee um, to have the extent of the legal advice and obviously, um, the, obviously the conversations that, that you are privy to. Um, so, yeah. um, and while we have a, a scrutiny rule, we are limited with the resource that we have. Yeah. No, and we fully appreciate that. Um, and I, su I suppose all I can say in, in conclusion is, you know, we had over 250 pieces of legislation to scrutinise and a lot of amendments to make. Um, one was very unfortunate, but it is only one. Um, it still doesn't um, excuse it, um, and it shouldn't have happened, but it did, and we're trying to put it right now. Well, we, we do recognise this is this is tricky, and there will be obviously changes and amendments and so on yeah. that need to be made. But yeah. I suppose if we can, will there be lessons learned from this? Experience? There will be. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, members. Any other comments to make, Mr. Muir? Obviously, we have to consider this and vote upon the, our, our situation with regards to this. We'll do that now. Yeah, but I would just like. Obviously, Roy said he's not going to support this. Um, I think we're, we're in this place to support the law of the land. Um, protocols that are working on Brexit, um, not an ideal situation. Protocol we wouldn't have chosen protocol, um, but that's what happens when when uh, Brexit's implemented in Northern Ireland, and we have to remain on the side of the law. So the other option is to not implement this, and then we end up uh, contravening law, and I don't think that's acceptable. So the responsible thing is to support this. Okay. So are members content to propose with the proposal for the statutory rule? Agreed. 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 No. no. With the exception of Mr. Beggs. Okay. Moving then on um, to departmental briefing on common frameworks. At page 127, we have the cover note and briefing paper from the department, followed by copies of the frameworks and comments from the House of Commons on the hazardous substances planning framework. At page 13 of table papers, appendix one, common frameworks, and tabled at page 51 with correspondence from Chloe Smith, MP, Parliamentary Scrutiny of Common Frameworks. And just to remind members that Hansard will record, record the meeting. And we'll welcome <laughs> um, Linda McHugh, Acting Deputy Secretary, Resources, Governance and EU, Bernie Rooney, Director of Gateways and EU Relations, Graham Banks, Gateways and EU Relations, and Brian Gorman is returning via Starleaf for the from the Planning Policy Division. And of course, you're all very welcome to the committee with regards to this um, this session. Uh, Linda, would you like to yep. take us through? And, and perhaps when we sort of set out from from the outset. I mean, my understanding that this is um, an overview of mm -hmm. of the frameworks, and that we will then be returning to them again in much more detail. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. Yes. So thank you for the opportunity this morning to provide an update on the department's work in relation to the development of the common frameworks. And as you said, I, I've been joined by a number of, of my colleagues um, and Brian is here specifically to talk about the, the land use planning one, which is outside my policy remit in the department. Um, so as the UK leaves the European Union, there will be a much greater onus on the UK government and the devolved administrations to develop policy in those areas which are currently governed by EU law, but which are otherwise within the area of competence of the devolved administrations. This means that post the transition period, there is potential for divergence between the UK government and the devolved administrations. It is therefore important that we establish appropriate mechanisms for the devolved administrations to work together uh, with the UK government in managing any emerging divergence. During the transition period, it has been identified that a common framework may be required to manage divergence in areas such as the land use planning aspects of hazardous substances, interoperability of the rail system, operator licensing for road transport, motor insurance, driver licensing and commercial transport. 
Across these policy areas, Whitehall and the devolved administrations have worked together to ensure the implementation of the requirements of EU directives and regulations. After the transition period, common frameworks in these areas will ensure there is a policy alignment across GB and NI where this is likely to be required, such as in the land use planning aspects of hazardous substances or where divergence in technical standards is anticipated, for example, in relation to the interoperability of the rail system. Each of these frameworks has been developed in line with the principles for common frameworks set out in the communique from the Joint Ministerial Council on European Negotiations, following its meeting on the 16th of October 2017. The five frameworks within the remit of DFI have been developed under the three following principles. Firstly, only where they are necessary to ensure the ongoing functioning of the UK internal market while meeting our international obligations. Two, they respect the devolution settlements and the democratic accountability of the devolved legislatures. And three, they recognise the economic and social linkages between Northern Ireland and Ireland, and that Northern Ireland will be the only part of the UK that shares a land border with the EU. The briefing material that we've provided sets out the five development phases for common frameworks. Each of the common frameworks presented here today has completed phase three review and assessment. The department welcomes the committee scrutiny of the frameworks and we will take on board your comments and queries as we seek to finalize agreement across the four administrations towards implementing these frameworks. Today is an opportunity to present the frameworks to the committee, outline the broad development process and provide an, an overview of each of the frameworks. There will be further opportunities for more detailed scrutiny should the committee feel that that would be helpful. Um, and I'll touch now briefly on each of the frameworks that we're, we're considering. So firstly, land use planning aspects of hazardous substances. This common framework encompasses the elements of the Seveso 3 Directive 2012-18 EU, which relates to land use planning, including planning controls in the presence of hazardous substances and handling development proposals, both for hazardous establishments and in the vicinity of those establishments. We are obliged to ensure that the objectives of preventing major accidents and limiting the consequences of such accidents are taken into account in land use policies. While there are very few planning applications for hazardous substances consent in Northern Ireland, this framework nonetheless allows for discussions on the principles for the development of a non-legislative framework across GB and NI post-EU withdrawal. The framework essentially commits each jurisdiction to maintain broad policy and legislative alignment in the area of hazardous substance consenting as it relates to land use planning. The rail interoperability framework covers the technical standards which apply to the operation of the rail network. A key UK Government EU exit priority for rail is to have flexibility over technical standards. However, the Northern Ireland Protocol lists the EU Directive on Technical Standards for Interoperability of the Rail Network, which will continue to apply in Northern Ireland after the transition period. This will result in a split interoperability regime in the UK, with Northern Ireland continuing to apply EU technical standards, while Great Britain applies its own rail technical standards, which may either align with or diverge from the EU technical standards for interoperability. The purpose of the Rail Interoperability Common Framework is to establish appropriate mechanisms in order to manage any divergence in the technical standards applicable in, the, in, in Northern Ireland compared to GB and to ensure unfettered access for trade in interoperable rail components between Northern Ireland and GB. The next framework covers motor insurance. The 2009 EU Motor Insurance Directive obliges all motor vehicles in the EU and the EEA to be covered by compulsory third party insurance and abolishes border checks on insurance so that vehicles can be driven easily between the EU and EEA countries. After the transition period, the UK loses automatic membership of the Green Card Free Circulation Zone, and if not readmitted, 
may seek to impose border checks for green cards. This is an area where Northern Ireland may choose to diverge from GB rules, although any change would need to align with current international obligations under the Interbureau Uniform Agreement between the Insurance Bureau and all countries that participate in the green card scheme. The purpose of this common framework is to establish appropriate mechanisms to manage any divergence between GB and NI in the application of the green card free circulation zone. Moving then on to driver licensing. Uh, driver li driving licences are governed by several international and EU arrangements. The UK government is seeking to conclude bilateral agreements on the mutual recognition of driving licence matters with individual member states. Driver licensing is devolved in Northern Ireland and as such NIE can diverge from the UK government position, although any change would need to take account of both the international conventions and any developing bilateral agreements. Like other frameworks, the purpose of the Driving Licence Common Framework is to establish appropriate mechanisms in order to manage divergence in driving standards and licensing regulations applicable in NIE when compared to GB. And then finally, the Commercial Transport and Operator Licensing for Road Transport Framework. This final framework is the Commercial Road Transport and Operator, operator Licensing for Road Transport Frameworks. Sorry. Um, it covers common rules for access to the international road haulage, bus and coach service, services market, limits on cabotage movements, certificates of professional competence rules, and the rules in obtaining an operator's licence. If any areas of divergence on these issues emerge from agreements with the EU, then this common framework will be required to manage those scenarios. So the five common frameworks have now completed phase three, with consensus being reached across the four administrations and approval from the review and assessment panel. The frameworks have now also been cleared by um, our minister in the department to proceed to phase four, which includes assembly, uh, assembly scrutiny. And the land use planning aspects of hazardous substances has also received joint ministerial council approval. Each of these frameworks covers a policy area where there is already a significant amount of collaborative working across GB and NI government departments. During our membership of the EU, much of this work has been about implementing EU directives and regulations while taking account of local circumstances. In future, these frameworks will formalise some of those working arrangements so that we can effectively manage alignment or divergent issues in these areas as they arise. So, In conclusion, I hope that that summary has provided you with an overview of the work undertaken to date and some further clarity around the issues associated with common frameworks. And we'd now be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Linda. Just in relation to, to process, really, and, and a timeline for all of this, um, we obviously have a receipt of the, the letter from, from Chloe Smith, who outlined um, at the scrutiny process flowchart. And within phase three, um, there is an element where it suggests that um, legislature will then decide the extent of the scrutiny required. Um, so that would be in phase three, but now we've moved into phase four. Should we have been having a conversation in advance of this as to what mechanisms um, we would then be following in order to um, to prepare even for scrutiny of the common frameworks? Mm -hmm. Well, I think... Or should, we have, or should we have received summaries, perhaps even in advance of, of this, rather than now moving into phase four? Should there have been some preparatory work done from the committee's perspective? I, I think the, the, the kind of complexity around um, the engagement with committee during the COVID pre period kind of prevented uh, some of this coming to, to committee. It probably should have been shared at an earlier stage. Unfortunately, the, um, the, the provisional frameworks were... A, a lot of the work on that was delayed due to uh, a, f a focus on uh, COVID recovery, and so a lot of emphasis has been uh, put on, on, on moving this uh, forward to the assembly scrutiny at the earliest opportunity. And this has really uh, been about as quick as we could uh, bring it to the committee. But I, th I think there possibly should have been uh, discussions earlier on 
um, just exactly the, the, the kind of process for where we are now and how we move forward through the, the scrutiny process. Because certainly whenever you came to committee before to discuss um, Brexit, we'd had a general discussion around frameworks and where we were with that at that stage. So it might have been appropriate perhaps even to have flagged that at, at that point, um, because certainly this committee would be flexible in accommodating the department at any time for additional meetings and so on in order to have that discussion had that been appropriate. So I suppose in, from that perspective it's disappointing, particularly with regards to um, the hazardous substance framework, because I understand that that was published on the 23rd of November and yet we're now on the 16th of December and obviously we, we've missed I suppose a certain degree of opportunity in order to, to scrutinise whenever today we're only looking at an overview rather than any real detail. I think Brian will uh, respond to that point. Brian. Yeah, my apologies Chair, uh, I mean this is a new process to ourselves and this, certainly we felt we were following the process in line with the other administrations. Um, we, we don't see that there's any bar on the uh, committee providing any input to this as we go along, and we don't see the deadline of for the the end date of the end of December as precluding any uh, further scrutiny by the committee. We're more than welcome to take that on board. So my apologies, but we felt we were, we were actually progressing this process in line with the other uh, jurisdictions. So uh, my apologies if there's feeling there's any delay. It certainly hasn't been uh, intentional on our part uh, as we've tried to move this forward. Okay, so, so just with regards to the hazardous substances, that, that will be implemented by the 31st of December, regardless of any scrutiny from this committee or, or elsewhere? That, that's a deadline that we, we don't, we're not fixed on that deadline. It's the deadline that we've heard in discussions with the other jurisdictions. But uh, from our point of view, you know, if this goes beyond this, I, I don't see any concerns myself in terms of taking out any comments from the committee through to discussions with the other jurisdictions uh, and progressing this. It's a new process to us, but I think what the committee can pass to us for us to bring uh, for further scrutiny, we have absolutely no issues with. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, and, and have the other um, assemblies and obviously, has, has it been scrutinised by the other devolved assemblies? Uh, I understand that it has been brought to all of the uh, other legislatures, but we haven't had a, 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 another session with the uh, other jurisdictions to understand exactly where they are in that process or to get feedback and review issues that may have been raised by the legislatures. Okay, but I just sort of want to clarify whether they had received that in advance of ourselves receiving that. Um, my understanding from the sort of informal engagement we have with our colleagues in other jurisdictions, some of them, they, they were in advance, but um, we're not operating to a fixed timetable in my view. So I don't think we lose anything by uh, like, the committee taking this time to scrutinise this. We bring those issues forward regardless of when they're provided to us. Okay, well, I appreciate what you've said, although in saying that whenever we see that there is a, an implementation um, period of the 31st of December, then that sort of red flags something to us with regards to where this committee sits. Yes, sir, but I, I, um, my understanding in terms of how this framework is implemented, it simply provides a framework for discussions on future policy issues. It's not that it's going to have an operational impact from the 31st of December. Uh, the intention of the framework is that we provide a framework for future policy engagement across the different administrations. Okay, I appreciate that. No, thank you. Um, Linda, you'd, you'd mentioned um, that it's really whether the committee feels that we should um, scrutinise this, obviously, as a, a scrutiny committee, and we've had this discussion in yes. pre the previous sessions. I, um, I'm going to assume that members will want to, to scrutinise yes. um, the elements of this. Uh, what, what is the role of scrutiny? You know, obviously, we can spend a lot of time on it, or we can spend a short period of time. But um, what, can, what change can we make, if any? And uh, I suppose I'm talking about what the, really the, the point of what mm -hmm. we do. Is it going to make real difference if we do um, actually have a, a, a concern? Well, coming new to this, my understanding has been that the devolved administrations have been trying to develop the frameworks. Um, with a degree of commonality and identifies areas where there could be divergence. Um, there is, as Brian has said, opportunity, absolutely. The 31st of December, as I understand it, is the 
uh, EU transition period end deadline. It's not a fixed deadline with regard to all the details of this. But where the detail will be important is looking forward at what policies are implemented in the future. And absolutely, the, the committee's um, role in that um, would be absolutely es essential and critical. So I think it's a and Graham can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that the devolved administrations has been trying to develop the frameworks identifying areas where there could be potential divergences and what the implications could be. Um, for example, travelling uh, across any border or over to Scotland or with your driving licence or whatever. And then the real issue comes um, when any particular devolved administration or region attempts to do, to do something different, and that's absolutely when we get into the detail. But, Graham, is that yep. correct? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think, in terms of just building on what Brian had mentioned earlier, in terms of the, the, the process and the scrutiny process and what you mentioned, Chair, in terms of the opportunity for, for committee to input into that, um, I, I, I'm in a slightly unfortunate position because Westminster kind of jumped the gun on the devolved administrations. And uh, they've had a, a, at least sight of this uh, in advance of, of, of committee here. Uh, my understanding is that the other devolved administrations, uh, in terms of the process in those areas, that it's following a timeline similar to our own, and uh, it's this week that uh, scrutiny committees and, and, and those legislatures will be examining uh, these frameworks. So we're, you know, we're broadly in line with colleagues in Scotland and Wales. Um, there will absolutely be an opportunity uh, to, to input and to provide an example. Um, at, West, at Westminster, there has been some input which has already uh, begun to filter through to, to consideration uh, for the, f the finalisation or the next stage, the implementation of these, these frameworks. Um, and so, uh, where a uh, committee you know, identifies a, a potential improvement, a streamlining, or a, a clarification in terms of uh, the um, the, the role of scrutiny on the, the development of policy uh, as it um, applies across these common frameworks. There's absolutely the opportunity to feed into that, and I think that's an important role for for committed to play. Well, and we're in daily <coughs> contact. We're in daily contact with officials uh, right across the department from all the nations. So this is moving at pace, um, but there is absolutely, uh, as Brian indicated, opportunity for the. The committee to uh, give any concerns or any directions that they wish. If I could, yeah, if I could make one further point, uh, Chair, is that this is a framework that we see going forward for the policy discussions. It has no impact on the legislation currently in place, which transposes through Northern Ireland domestic legislation, the EU uh, directive requirements. It's only when uh, the EU uh, directives cease to be that common source of requirements in all of the jurisdictions, depending on uh, future agreements, that there may be discussions in terms of how each administration wants to move forward if there are changes required in those policy areas. Even if we get to the point where there is a degree of policy divergence or policy development, we will still be trying, or we will still be bringing that forward through domestic legislation, and the normal scrutiny process of the Assembly applies uh, as we normally follow. Yeah, so, I mean, I think we are bringing this to you today um, and we would welcome um, any views that, that this committee has and those will then be reflected back through to the, the discussions um, at, um, between Whitehall and the devolved administrations and as will, I think, likely the, the, the views of the other um, jurisdictions um, and then we'll have to, to try and reach a, a common view on any, any amendments that... that need to be made and we may then need to come back with the, the final versions yeah. um, so it, it might be an iterative process um, and I suppose you know we'd be keen to hear from, from you as a committee as to how you want to take forward the scrutiny of this um, and as Brian and, and um, Graham have said you know whilst the end of the transition period is the end of this month these frameworks will only really need to kick in as and when we start to look at divergence and that's not going to happen in the next few months, you know, so I think there is some time to get this right. It's better to get it right than to, to, to get it done, if you, if you know what I mean, by, by the end of this month, which I think is, is clearly not going to give you the scrutiny rule that is enshrined in the process. Yes, Chair, if it's helpful, we're, what we're trying to do is map out what are day one issues, what are week one issues, what is month one, month three, and we're trying to identify that kind of timeline so that we would know what we ought to bring and, and when. But it's not, not entirely a 
clear process at the moment. So. Okay, thank you for that. And I'm, I'm going to avoid getting into the detail of any specific um, framework, rather than just to ask what um, stakeholder engagement that you've had locally with regards to these. On, on, on the rail interoperability. Um, I'm sorry, I can't hear you very well. Sorry, on, on, on the rail interoperability framework, um, there has been engage, engagement with NI Railways as the, the infrastructure managers, uh, and it's quite right that um, they would be, you know, have input into that process. Okay, and that is, and that is the case with all of the frameworks you have engaged. Um, the hazardous substances chair was the because this was one of the pathfinders that stakeholder engagement was actually managed through uh, Whitehall. Um, I think the input from the Northern Ireland element may have come through the executive office colleagues, but again, the stakeholder engagement we, uh, that will impact policy and development would be where we see any points of policy intention or amendment going forward. The framework is simply how we would engage in those discussions. So if we think there is a policy requirement or a legislative amendment required, we would then follow the normal policy development consultation and legislative process at that stage. So really, at this stage, um, engagement has been fairly limited? It has been limited from our perspective with uh, the officials across the, um, the four jurisdictions at this stage, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I understand Mr Muir is going to leave early, so... No, Ms. Kimmins. Oh, sorry. I need my glasses on, sorry. Ms Kimmins, could we call Liz for a question? Yeah, thanks, Chair. And I don't know whether it maybe... Oh. Mine, mine were more specific to... Some of the frameworks. Um, so, are we are we going to try and get into a wee bit of detail around it, or what? What's the suggestion? Yeah. Sorry, could you repeat that? It was, it was no, I was just saying. I know you. I know you'd said there about maybe not getting into too much detail on the on the individual frameworks, but because that's what my question mine was just around the driver license. And is it okay for me to go ahead then? It's, you go ahead. Yeah, no, it was just as under the, the driver licence framework, it is stated that it's within the North's gift to set their own driving standards and licence and regulations. Um, but divergence is unlikely, given the benefit of the into the current UK driving st standards, which are considered to be of a high quality. So it was just really to see, would that not pre prejudice the decision of the Minister and whether or not to diverge? Um, so there is a choice, but is there one choice that's better to take? Um, and clearly, maybe we, the department could be um, setting up a bilateral agreement with the South on driving license as an urgent matter, I think, because I know people are, are really keen to know what the outcome of that's going to be. I think the response to that would depend on position that would, that would arise if either the EU or um, Whitehall decided to do something different to what's happening now. And then I think, as, as, as officials, we would need to look at you know, how either one or the other is starting to diverge and then make a decision or, or make our own recommendation to the minister um, about what is best for our local circumstances. And you know, it, it could be that we align um, with GB, but equally, it, it, there could be a decision that actually we're not, you know, we're part of an island and it, it might be better to, to align um, with the EU because of that. But I, I think it would depend on the nature of the divergence. Um, you know, we'd have to do the policy research, make recommendations, bring it to the committee, and then the minister would decide on, on you know, which to align with or whether we actually maintain our own status quo. Yeah, so does the minister not have a Sorry, we didn't hear you. Sorry. Can you repeat that again? Um, at the end of the minute, we have a view on, on that um, in relation to that, or where does that sit with? Apologies, we still can't hear you properly. Can you try again? Yeah, no, I was just saying, I'm getting a bit of food. Actually, yeah, it might be useful perhaps if you sent an email through and I'll, I'll ask the question for you. That would be okay? Yeah. Okay, we'll move on then to Mr Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for your presentation. Um, big challenges ahead, there's no doubt, and I, I do agree in terms of it, it's it's not really about legislation or policy. Mm. It's about the rollout of where we actually go. I mean, it's a bit of a public message. It's a message out the business world. It's COVID, it's Brexit, and all of that. All of, it's north, south, east, west. Mm -hmm. 
and, and I'm going to couch my language in, in relation to that because there's big challenges here. Because the general public is going to become, and I agree with the chair, the chair had asked whether or not we have a scrutiny. Well, obviously, we will have. Mm -hmm. We will offer some thoughts. Mm -hmm. But most of that is going to come from the general public and the business <coughs> board mm -hmm. in relation to the frameworks. And it's how we operate. Um, because the first thing people are going to be asking is about green cards, mm -hmm. or what lorries can go where, what, or how the hauliers are going to operate, or how we transfer goods, and all of those things. And the framework leads to, especially in particular to our elements in terms of real operability and all of those things mentioned. But I just want to go back to the framework. The framework is a joint decision making is required within it, in terms of so it's joint decision required. In, and the point I ask, I ask in this context because clearly most of these matters are devolved matters anyway within our department. You see, if, if the minister wanted to move outside the framework, has she the powers to do that? Say the north south operations were going to be adversely impacted for the, for the sake of yeah. the economy. Has the minister got any powers to move outside the framework to? Well, I think that the frameworks aren't actually about policy. The frameworks basically set out how we would deal with diverging policies. So it, it, it's the, the process and the mechanism rather than, you know, we have this framework of, of say, driver licence policy um, and how we're going to move away from that. So, so these aren't about <coughs> moving out. It's about dealing with divergence. No, I appreciate it, Linda, but I'm yeah. only asked the question. I'm mindful we're coming out of COVID yeah. with big economic challenges. Yeah. So we need to be snappy in terms of... Yeah. The minister needs to make a decision. Do you, mm -hmm. do you understand me? Yeah. Yes. Because this is all new to all of us. Yes. And it's a new thing, and I asked it in that context, yeah. and where we move as yeah. a, a general. And, and you are absolutely right. You know, I think in some people's heads, the whole EU exit thing will disappear on the first of January 2021. You know, the end of the transition period. As officials, <laughs> we're actually thinking this is the start of it because, you know, we are going to have to. Um, you know, I think I think in the past. With the UK and Ireland and, and the rest of the EU all following the same directives and the same standards, and, and there, was, there was a degree of homogenisation, albeit there was a bit of leeway at times to, to, to deal with um, local issues, even within the directive framework. Uh, but now we're going to have to look at both what the EU is doing and what um, Whitehall might be doing, what other devolved administrations might want to do for areas that are devolved, and then, you know. Looking at that and around, make a decision about what's right to do here for our own local circumstance. Um, and it will be a whole new area of work for not only me, but the rest of the civil service and you know, me and my team. It, 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 this, will, this will be throughout the civil service. We will have to look at very many different areas of policy development. No, no I understand that. And yeah. that's why it's important today. Yeah. But we're setting up a framework here, but we're going to have to be one flexible. Yeah. We're going to have to be reactionary. Yeah, and, that, and that's, I, th I suppose, what is enshrined within the, these frameworks. That you know that there is a, a realization. So, for example, on, on rail interoperability, um, it, because that's enshrined in the Northern Ireland Protocol, we are required to follow um, EU law on that one, um, and that does make sense because we have, you know, an island where trains run between two jurisdictions, and if we had different standards, that would make that pretty operationally impossible. Um, so the framework will then deal with how that divergence will be handled um, in terms of, of the UK. And, and I think that the one area there is that, that you know, if there's, say, manufacturers of train parts, they could very well end up having to, to manufacture to do separate standards, one to service our market and one to service the rest of GV. No, no, I appreciate it. But, but my main angle is I'm trying to marry up where we go, how we work with the general public, because mm -hmm. generally that's what we're going to get, as yeah. and we've seen through COVID, the yeah. number of questions. Yeah. Are, but, but just specifically, because there's a couple of points I want to see in terms of the de decision making for it, that's all officials and, and legal experts and everything else. What role has the minister in relation to that? Um, is it politically or bi weekly meetings, or is the minister any role in relation to that for itself? No. Um, well, I suppose officials are, are working to. to Develop, but it'll be ministers who will have to sign right. off. No, 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 I was only, I'm just going by, by yeah, your yeah. paper. Just, um, yeah, yeah, the framework just devises the common approach <coughs> that all regions will adopt uh, in order to take forward 
the policy position with the various administrations post 31? So, no, no, it's, it's only what um, I'm just. I just want to ask you a few weeks yeah. specific yeah. questions. Definitely, cabotage is an issue now. It's Absolutely. been raised, but so I see there on page one forty-eight of your briefing, um, and it says about the British Embassy in Dublin, that part um, in relation to making decisions on the issue on page one forty-eight of the. And uh, let's bring it up here myself. Here for you. Just, um, yeah, it's a. Uh, it's on the roads and responsibilities, and it says that the officials from the British Embassy in Dublin, these officials responsible for making decisions on any issue which may arise, such as decisions on cabotage. And my part is, my question is, in relation to those decisions, what engagements has there been with the Irish government in relation to that, or has there been any? Or you're not familiar with that yet? Or? Well, um, the issue on, on cabotage, um, we have had informal discussions with officials, but we can't enter into any formal negotiation on anything at the moment because it's all tied in with the wider negotiations. Um, so uh, we may end up with cabotage being covered by whatever comes out of either Brussels or London, but if it doesn't, then it's likely to be for the UK government to, to um, either uh, negotiate with the EU on that specific thing, or um, negotiate bilaterally with Ireland if it, if it turns out to be an issue on the island of Ireland. Um, but it is a it is a difficult issue. Um, and, and that's my follow-on question. I mean, if you do not secure the cabotage, or, mm -hmm. or you know, in terms of special rooms for CPC residency, I mean, you want to diverge then from the British rules. You know, how does that? How do you foresee that? And I appreciate it because. The way I see it, these questions are going to come quick and fast. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know it's not going to be first yeah. of January, but but I know as business rolls out, and how haulers and all of the sectors roll out, we as elected reps are going to be asked questions, mm -hmm. and we're going to be bringing them here yeah. to the table. Mm -hmm. We're going to be going to the departments, yeah. and and I think the general yeah. public is well ahead of the game here. Yeah. Was there in terms of asking questions, not understanding all the rules, no, yeah. but certainly coming to us, and I mean. You know, so I'm wondering, you know, those kind of things need to be discussed now. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate the framework and we've all set up and we're, we're trying to foresee exactly where we're going with all this here. But in some cases, there are people going to be ahead of the game and asking questions. Yeah. We may not have all the answers. Yeah. But as part of the role, probably not even a scrutiny, but yeah. uh, working with the department to get some of those issues yes. out because uh, they're going to come in, in yeah, question yeah. form. To and actually, on, on cabotage, really the decisions will have to be made by third countries because um, you know the, the issue with cabotage is what happens in a third country and so it's, it's yeah, going to have absolutely. to be set in either their law or EU law as to what we can and cannot do once we cross a border um, so that's where we'll be relying either on um, as I said you know a, a negotiated agreement with the EU or individual bilateral agreements with um, individual countries well, then, my final question on, on cabotage, mm -hmm. because you're saying there about the, the minister being able to make decisions, and I said about being reactionary, because we may have to. Mm -hmm. I, I don't mean make it, I don't mean make it in, in split second, mm -hmm. but what I am saying to you, for the benefit of North, South, and East, West, mm -hmm. some of those decisions are going to have to be made. Are we saying here the minister has the powers to make those decisions? It doesn't matter where it's across the jurisdiction. Now. And I think that would depend on, on the decision. As I said, I, I'm not sure that, that any minister here could decide on cabotage in a third country. But our minister would clearly have a role in um, you know, lobbying her, her counterparts right. and, and making the case. I appreciate it, and that's the difficulty of yeah. it all. You know. yeah. Yeah. Can, can I just uh, yeah, expand absolutely. on that a little bit, Linda? Um, the, the, the minister will have sorry. The, the minister will have the, the authority to make it, to make decisions over anything which is a devolved matter, and so if that leads us to um, a position which diverges from from GB, then that, the, the framework is there to help manage where that diverge, divergence emerges. But provided um, the minister is, uh, you know, it's, it's within her gift um, on a devolved matter to, to make the decision, then she can make the decision. And if that takes us to a position which is divergent, then that is something which can absolutely happen. I oh, appreciate it. Chair, sure, it's a broader discussion. We could mm -hmm. talk all day, but I'll let all the members in. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And can I just ask, uh, obviously, um, the devolved arrangements are very different between each of 
of the legislature. Could you maybe give us some clarity as to which as which um, of these frameworks are just purely for Northern Ireland only? Um, well, I think all of them are designed to make sure that Whitehall and the other three devolved administrations can deal with any divergence. So we are involved in, in all of them. But there, there will be some that Northern Ireland will have particular interest in that perhaps Wales and Scotland won't? Yeah, re rail interoperability would be an example of that. Um, the, the, the only competent authority uh, on interoperability of the rail system in GBA is the Office for Road and Rail at Westminster, and the, the department here would be the equivalent for Northern Ireland. There wouldn't be equivalent departments in, in Wales or... Or Scotland, even though they would have an interest, obviously, as they have the, yeah. the, the rail systems there. So it's really only in relation to the round rail? That's the only issue? That's the only aspect of these that will be for Northern Ireland only? I couldn't speak for I couldn't speak for for driving driving licences and uh, motor insurance or the, the other areas. It's okay. outside my policy there, but okay. interoperability would be an example. I'm to assure the committee strong representation has been made. Um, about concerns about driving licence and, and particularly um, professional driving licences. Sure. And so, uh, Minister has written to counterparts, uh, making strong representations, um, so is that there's no disadvantage to the Northern Ireland economy or, or professional or personal drivers. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, a lot of my questions have already been um, asked and answered um, <coughs> here today. Um, just what, one of the issues that uh, I think it was Carol who talked about this is that the risk of um, the minister diverging and then causing consequences, um, which would be significant um, in terms of travel between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland or between Northern Ireland and GB. Um, I understand there's Section 12 freezing powers around this, and I just wanted to say a bit more about what those powers are and have they been invoked yet in terms of these, this situation with regards to the frameworks. I, I wouldn't have the specific details on that, but the, um, the person that have not been invoked to my knowledge. Sorry, I don't have detail either. I'd need to go and check it out and come back. I understand that's part of the UK government to intervene and to then direct the devolved uh, legislature to actually do what's instructed. My understanding is that the, um, that is trying to be avoided. But um, I, I'm sorry, I don't have sufficient detail. I'd need to check it out. Yeah, but certainly, I, I, I don't think it, it, it will have happened yet because these aren't in operation yet. Um, so, um, is part not a safeguard against sort of the risk of the devolved assemblies yes. diverging? But also, there is a concern of the UK government yet again are going to be interfering in the devolved assemblies. I'd be content to take that away and look at it if, yes, if that's the intent, Chair. Ms. Anderson. Um, thank you, Chair. And uh, for our sins on the Executive Office, we have dealt, uh, the committee has dealt with this uh, quite a bit. And I concur with you. I think it's coming very late uh, to this committee uh, for, for our discussion because the Executive Committee has been dealing with the scrutiny of the overall common framework uh, process and governance. <coughs> and it can sound very jargonistic. Uh, to most people, which I think it is. Uh, if you said to anyone in any of our constituencies about a common framework, um, not saying that people are um, in any way not intelligent enough to understand it, but they certainly probably don't uh, see the relevance of it. And so this is EU law um, that created cons consistency um, across this island and, and with, with the island in Britain. So, given that Brexit is going to result in regulatory divergence, just to ensure that we're all in the same framework in the last conversation, and this, uh, we're all in the same frame, that the compliance with the protocol takes precedence, regardless of whether the British government is going to interfere. Um, is that uh, that's where we're at on this? Given what you said mm -hmm. about the SR, okay. So, there's 154 areas. Uh, where EU law intersects uh, with, the, with the different assemblies, and the 151 of those touch here on, on, the, on the north. Uh, those areas apply. This was all supposed to be sorted out before the 31st of December, and this committee this is our first discussion with it, because it hasn't. So out of all of those areas, 
Uh, there's six that's being prioritised, one of them being the hazardous, hazardous substance. And the thing that I find lacking, just Linda, maybe because I'm assuming Chair will have to come back to this uh, in the new year, um, there's three principles of this common framework and a lot of the presentations that I'm hearing or getting involved in, ex hearing exchanges of, um, are around east-west, the common framework of the the impact of divergence, but the third principle is is north south, mm -hmm. and the All Ireland in the context of the Good Friday Agreement. So, I know you, Linda, I picked up what you said about the hazardous substance framework, and we have to follow EU law, and obviously then around the divergence. But what struck me when I read the papers, it stated what may become possible post Brexit, that is not possible now. Um, is that the devolved administrations will have the power within a domestic context, context to relax requirements on the level of substances. Now, I find that a bit, um, it, it jumped out at me. Why would we want to relax requirements on hazardous substance? Surely we would want to stay with the, with the highest standards. So I'm asking, is the minister countenancing relaxing standards or does the protocol set where we're at with regards to um, the hazardous substance? If I can maybe bring Brian in on that one. Okay. Yeah, sorry, that's not the intention of that, Ms. Anderson. Um, and th this is the way the framework is written is to provide a framework for all of the administrations. Um, where we would move to is that we would step away from the common source of directives and I think across all of the jurisdictions we quite regularly have fairly high standards uh, in practical terms the only way you would seek going forward to amend the hazardous substances would be if there was maybe a new substance or concerns raised about the levels or the common storage of substances so if that inference is given that's not the um, consideration of officials in taking this forward that you would be relaxing it uh, it may be that for practice you may have some considerations about storage concerns, and if that was not something that had a common source requirement in the EU directive, you then have allowed to change that. But again, within the default uh, situation. Can I ask you, Brian, around minerals, hazardous, uh, dangerous minerals, for instance, in, to purify our water, water quality that we have? Um, I'm losing the sound there. Apologies. Okay, the officials here might be able to pick it up. We've had NI water, and we have asked about Brexit and the consequence of the minerals that are required um, to pur purify the water, and they can only stockpile for a number of weeks. So in the event of, for instance, something were to happen in 15 days' time, and there was a need, it was felt by some to stockpile mo mm -hmm. more, but they have already told us it's dangerous to stockpile. Mm -hmm. This could actually be changed to enable departments potentially to do that, or if they so wished, if the minister so wished yeah. and agreed to. But, but to change policy like that, you would need to go through the whole policy process mm -hmm. with risk assessment, environmental impact. Um, the policy is going to be changed anyway. I mean, as we, when we're coming out of the EU, maybe not in relation to yeah. this, but the 151 areas, uh, there's some of it legislative, there's some of it non-legislative. Yeah. This one's a non-legislative one, but it's going to have implications. But you know that this framework could not um, deal with, for example, a, um, if there was concern that, that um, chemicals were running low, well, sure, we'll just use the framework and, and change the regulations. And mm -hmm. bingo, you know, Northern Water can, can um, stockpile more chemicals because A, that's going to be dangerous, and, and B, um, this framework only provides a mechanism to, to work through what might be diverging policies. It's not about the policy change in and of itself. That would be a whole separate process, and um, you know, it would take a considerable amount of time and consideration to put through. Well, what did the term, you know, within the domestic context, to relax requirements on the level of substance mean? Because that's what the committee was told. That what may become possible post Brexit that is not possible now is that the devolved administrations will have the powers within a domestic context to relax requirements. 
So what is relaxed requirements? Just to satisfy myself yeah. that we're not actually walking in to potentially someone going to argue the case that we need to have. Sorry, I think I'm back on here sideways. It's merely a possibility because you, you could, depending on the agreement, be moving away from what is the common sort of part of an EU directive. So that while it's a poss it may be a possibility, there's no policy intent in moving that way. And if you're not going to be able to change anything on the basis of this framework, you're still bound by policy and legislative requirements. So if a situation arose that, for example, you've used the Northern Ireland water and wanted to stockpile, or anybody wanted to stockpile hazardous substances that was not in line with current legislation, we would need to look at amending the legislation, but that would be through the normal legislative process. Okay, it's just that what was written for us, Chair, can certainly give that impression um, in the information that we received. So I, I just no, think well, it's... My apologies, because it, okay. there, there is no policy intent that is being discussed in these groups no, at well, the minute. Uh, this is, pure, this is purely how we're going to engage, should that be the, the, the case. And it's to make sure administrations are aware across the board if we were proposing any change, uh, or we may learn from other jurisdictions. And that's all, that, that, that's a limit of that at the moment. If I, have I read it right, Chair, that the information we received when they talk about green cards, has the ministers the power to resolve the green card uncertainty? I live in Derry. Bonkrana is four miles away. Um, I can actually put one foot in the north and another foot in the south. So, for instance, someone like myself that would have friends and relatives um, on the other side of the border, um, that I may it may be for people like ourselves and everyone else in the north may need to have a green card to go to the south of Ireland, whereas somebody can come in from Spain or Germany or Italy, land in Dublin, come into the south, go into the south and can drive around without a green card. But those of us who live in the island will. So does the information that we receive here, is the minister mindful to resolve that green card uncertainty? Well, again, um, at the moment, you're right that, you know, come the 1st of January, um, anybody driving a car um, into the south will need a green card. And, and that is the current position, and that's an impact of, of leaving the EU. Um, but has the minister done anything to try to resolve this? Because when I read the information, there was a suggestion that, uh, that maybe the minister would have the powers to, uh, to resolve such an uncertainty. Min uh, this is part of the negotiations at the moment, so the Minister doesn't have the authority at this point in time to make a difference. She has made strong representations um, about the, the uh, disruptiveness that this could cause um, to the, through the um, various authorities of the negotiating team in uh, Department for Transport. They have been made fully aware of the concerns about this, um, um, but there are, this is a we're an insurance issue. I'm sorry if you're already aware. I apologise if you're already aware. But um, Northern Ireland could, like the uh, hazardous waste, have the possibility of diverging. Um, however, um, any change would need to align with the international obligations under uh, something which I'm not familiar with the detail of, to be honest, but the Inter-Bureau Uniform Agreement between the Insurance Bureau of all countries that participate in the Green Card Scheme. So, whilst yes, it's absolutely not the preferred uh, position, um, and representations, representations have been made about um, the inconvenience and the disruption for drivers and the confusion for, for the citizen of Northern Ireland, um, we really need to await the outcome of the EU UKG negotiations um, before any, any action can be taken. But does the minister not need to alert people in 15 days' time? There are 30,000 people who cross the border every day to work or to study. 60% yeah. of the movement is in my own constituency, Derry and Donegal, um, of cross-border movement. Yes. Thousands of people cross yes. the border, and yes. therefore they need to know that in order yeah. for their insurance to be covered. And that is part of the, the public um, awareness yes. campaign. Yes. Um, you know, all the details of this are on NI Direct. And, and, and actually, all insurance mm. companies really should be automatically issuing green cards to, to all of their customers. Yeah. And I can um, tell you, I haven't had one. Mm -hmm. And I live four miles away, and I'm not. not um, it's a situation and, for many, yeah. thousands and thousands of people. I know, in the, the run up to, um, you know, when we thought we were having a hard Brexit this time last year, 
Um, some insurance companies proactively sent out green cards. Mm -hmm. um, others waited yeah. for customers to get in touch with them and say, can you issue me with a green card? So my advice is to anybody, if you haven't got a green card and you regularly cross the border, or even are planning in the near future to cross the border, you need to contact your insurance company. And get well, I think it card. goes back to maybe what the chair had said about the need for us to have had perhaps engagement on the subject matter beforehand, because there is a role for the committee as well and for us to alert our own constituents to that. One final point on the rail inoperability. Um, surely the minister is not countenance engaging with components that are potentially below uh, the EU standard. Again, just it might be an interpretation or my read of the information that came through. No, uh, no, no, absolutely not. Um, the, the, uh, the purpose of the framework is to provide those mechanisms so that any trade and interoperable components coming into to Northern Ireland or leaving Northern Ireland to go into to GB uh, are, are meet the appropriate standards. So uh, the department as a competent authority would be assessing any any goods coming in, as it does now, um, to ensure that they meet the, the EU technical standards for interoperability. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr Buchanan. Okay. Thank you all so far. Uh, Linda, I suppose a question just to pick up on your point. Could you clarify we're in phase four? We're now moving into phase four. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so so we're referring here to parliamentary scrutiny of provisional frameworks. So if here this devolved area or Scotland or Wales, for example, had a problem or an issue with any of those frameworks, what's the process and what's the timeline for EG here in Northern Ireland come back and say, no, we, we're not happy with that part of that framework. So what's the timeline? And what influence have we got on all the other ones? And how is the decision made that we all come to a common agreement with that issue, irrespective of which devolved area it comes from? I think that largely depends on um, how much uh, concern there is, not only potentially here, but in other jurisdictions. And that issue, on whatever the issue is. Yeah, yeah on, on what the issue is and whether it can be resolved. Um, because, you know, that, um, I mean, it is unfortunate that, you know, this process hasn't kicked off sooner. Um, as we said, you know, we, we are, um, in terms of timeline, in line with the other um, devolved administrations. So I think we need to allow the time for, for both you as a committee and um, my minister to consider what the final Northern Ireland position would be. And then that's going to have to come together with the other jurisdictions before we can actually sign off on, a, on an agreed common framework. So, so what is that timeline? At what point do we say... This committee or, or this devolved area or Scotland, for example, can't go back and feed into that common framework. At what point is it too late for that? There's to no, back there's no, there's no firm time, no. there's no firm timeline. And I mean, the, 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 the key is about uh, ensuring we have that framework to manage any area of divergence. And it's, as uh, colleagues have mentioned earlier, it's about getting it right. And so there is no, there is no fixed deadline to which we're working to this. Although obviously it is. Uh, it will be beneficial to have um, each of the frameworks in place as soon as po we possibly can. But it is very important that we take on board these points, that we don't jump to uh, a, a, a situation where we, we, there's potentially concern that isn't addressed and that could result in a difficulty within, within the frameworks. And so, um, at, at this moment in time, there's no, there's no firm deadline. Some of these frameworks may, may be easier to, to, to reach agreement. Uh, between the administrations and uh, engage with committee and, and you know, uh, receive their final approval before others. Although it's uh, obviously want to get them in place as soon as we possibly can in 2021. But there's obviously no end date, but there has to be a timeline. Chair, could I, could I maybe just set out um, that we're currently in, in, in phase um, three, moving into phase four. Is that That's right. right. Phase three is about um, detailed policy development resulting in a provisional framework for confirmation. So these frameworks are to agree a common approach across the nations. Phase four is actually the, yeah. the important area and it's described as the implementation and framework agreement. So we're not anything in these documents we're not confined or set in stone. It's just that the nations have agreed a a common approach as to how they would address issues such as driving license and things like that. So there would be um, collaborative work, it's described in, in the overall framework document as collaborative work to prepare implementing legislation, primary and secondary, as appropriate and non-legislative elements of individual frameworks. That's what I mentioned earlier where we get into the nitty gritty detail where proposals would come to committee for consideration and we would uh, consult and take views on what 
uh, on how things would be implemented moving forward within uh, the devolved administration. So this is just really setting the common approach of how things would be dealt with so that no nation goes off and does something that is actually of real um, disadvantage to, you know, that we wouldn't want to, for example, if lorries are going across to Scotland, we wouldn't want to uh, have any barriers with trade. So there is a further stakeholder consultation process. There is parliamentary scrutiny um, of the provisional framework. So that is all the detail of the next stage. This, is, this document is primarily setting out the common approach that each of the devolved administrations would take. Um, should we be left in this situation when the, when the outcome of the negotiations are known? And at this point, unfortunately, we have, we have no indication of what the position is. So this is re this, there is a clear process that each devolved administration would go through. And then this is just the common approach document. And phase four is the framework's implementation framework, framework agreement. So that's when we'll be coming back and forth saying, well, this is what is being proposed on driving licences. Uh, what are your views on this? Are you content? But it, w it will be, as Linda said earlier, the real work starts post 1 January if we're left in this situation. Okay, thank you. And with regard to communications, um, uh, if I may say, the, uh, the department has looked at the various customers and as soon as we know the outcome, we have looked at all the channels of who to inform, how to inform, and what is the key message, and looked at the, the uh, social inclusion, for example. I think um, Mr Borland said, if, if, if you're an 80-year-old driver, you may not use NI Direct. So, um, so leaflets, information through post offices. So we have, um, if you like, an outline strategy in place with communication channels identified. Mm. Our difficulty at the moment is, until the negotiations conclude, we have no message that we can communicate. I suppose I am a bit concerned with the, the no fixed deadline, given the fact that we are aware that there, there will be issues that have been identified even within um, these sort of draft frameworks. And I suppose the concern that I do have um, being in this place for such a long time is that policy development and then moving forward with legislation can be quite uh, a slow process mm -hmm. and yet there will be very real issues on the ground that will need to have a speedy response as opposed to a very long protracted process that we're used to yeah. and I do I, I am concerned with the commentary around no deadlines because there will be deadlines and there will need to be deadlines. Yeah, I, I think that the challenge will be if there are real operational issues that need to be addressed and the only way to do that is to, for example, change primary legislation because then we're in a position where we can't, we can't change primary legislation procedures other than argue that actually we need an urgent procedure. And, and I mean, I suppose the, the response to COVID has shown that, that if things are absolutely required, you need to do something very quickly. Um, and I suppose you know, the real deadline for these frameworks is um, the first time that we need to do something that diverges in these areas. Um, and you know, I, can't, I, I honestly can't see that if, if we are in a, in a position on the 1st of January, um, I don't think we can afford to hang around waiting for you know, to change primary legislation, we would have to find a, a mitigating measure that is much more immediate than that um, to deal with the immediate concern. It might then raise a policy issue that we'll have to look at in the longer term. Um, but you know, relying on legislation, um, a, a legislative change to address an immediate operational problem, I think wouldn't work. We'd have to try and find a mechanism or, you know, to, to, not to get around legislation, but, but to actually work with our, our counterparts, wherever the, the issue is, to find a, a, an immediate operational solution to this. Okay, Linda, what I'm going to ask you is for some reassurance that uh -huh. in the last four years where we've been discussing this uh -huh. and with all the different sort of planning for various scenarios uh -huh. that you have had, that there will, be, um, there will be some constants within that where there may be sort of issues yeah. um, that work has started mm -hmm. and that we aren't at the situation where <laughs> Come the first of January. Yeah, that's yeah. when you're only really sort of focused on that work. Yeah. So yeah. please no, give I mean, me that assurance today. 
Yeah, we have looked at Nothing. you know the day one issues, yeah. and there are still we've we've worked as hard as we can um, within the legal framework that we've got to mitigate as many of the the potential issues as we can. You know, there are um, three or four issues which are still a bit of a cause from cons concern. Um, you know, so we've got Interbus, we've got the ECTM um, uh, licences, um, we've got an issue with some of the driver's licences that were extended for a year because of COVID and the, the, the recognition of those in third countries. Um, and uh, we've got some potential issues that may that we may have a role in around supply chain. So, you know, if there's um, traffic disruption at the port, we would need to kick in through our traffic control measures to, to, to manage that as, as best we can, along with PSNI. Um, now, you know, we've looked at mitigating measures for all of those. Um, ideally, um, they will not be an issue because in the next day or a week or whatever, we will have an agreement. But if we don't, we then need to go to, to plan B or in some cases plan C. And, and we, you know, we've, we've worked through all of those. Um, but some of them will require um, negotiation at minimum bilaterally. Um, and that's where we cannot do anything at this point in time. Um, but you know, we're aware of the issues and we're as prepared as we can be. Thank you. Mr. Beggs. <coughs> Again, thanks for your presentation, Linda. Uh, it is uh, an area we need, all need to be very careful of, and I actually commend the process that you've done through it, because they, uh, we in Northern Ireland are probably more vulnerable than any other region mm -hmm. of diverging from either Europe or EU and becoming vulnerable as such because of our interdependability. Mm -hmm. um, my, my, uh, uh, question is, uh, to what extent has there been engagement to date with uh, the Road Haulage Association and Logistics UK? I mean, to me, these are the guys at the, at the coal face who will know the issues mm -hmm. quickly when they arise and yeah. have a mechanism to react to yeah. them. Well, for the past few years, the department um, has had regular stakeholder engagements. Um, Informally, at, at official level, formally with the minister, we've held workshops um, throughout this whole process, um, and you know we have good working relationships with the Road Haulage Association, um, and I mean clearly they are also concerned. Um, so we, we know what their issues are, um, and we are working as closely with them as, as we can, as indeed we are with you know, the ferry operators, for example. Um, you know there was a period last year where there was a fear that we might run out of ferry capacity across the Irish Sea. We did an awful lot of work with both the haulage industry and the ferry companies and the ports to identify um, you know, the, the, the capacity on the ferries. And actually, we realised through that work that capacity itself wasn't an issue. There might be an issue about um, the, uh, the paperwork, the goods to get them on and off the ferries. Um, and you know, we, we've worked. Um, to, to try and get that message out that actually the paperwork needs to be right, but we don't need, for example, to buy extra capacity on, on the RSC ferry. So, I mean, there's been an awful lot of very close engagement, and, and actually, um, in uh, sort of probably late late summer, early autumn, um, the minister had a um, a specific meeting with the road haulage um, sector. Um, on all, all of these issues, so she has also been closely engaged. It might have been mid-autumn. I, I don't quote me on the date, but it, it, it was within the last month or two, anyway. I mean, for, for ourselves, you know, we have to carry a green card. That's, that's not a huge issue mm -hmm. if we have to until there's a, a wider agreement. But uh, I am concerned that we are listening to the uh, the haulage industry, because this is this is feeding mm -hmm. the economy, it's feeding jobs, yes. and if there are interruptions, it can cost jobs, it can cost mm -hmm. loss loss of business and long term implications. Yeah. Um, so my my question around that is: Are are you um, ensuring that on the first of January, or what what needs to be done to ensure that on the first of January that issues such as Operator licensing regulations mm -hmm. in the EU, which we will no longer be in a part of, mm -hmm. 
will, will not cause interruption to, to mo the movement of uh, vehicles um, and technicalities over uh, a driver's uh, licence. Um, change of CPC rules. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think it's important that, that we are listening to uh, the regulations that are applicable in the EU, but also we have to maintain our, our, our regulations uh, applicable to the UK. Uh, one of the issues I've picked up uh, of recent weeks is the, the importance of backloads. Mm -hmm. So what may seem to be a very small amount, or it doesn't matter so many effect in that small area, that can affect the, the, the huge cost implication uh, in transportation costs mm -hmm. for goods. So I think we all need to be watching out for uh, issues that may arise and react quickly uh, to, to try and have them addressed. So, so can you tell me on the 1st of January, mm -hmm. can a driver from Northern Ireland legally drive in the Republic? Uh, haulage or uh, HGV driver? Yeah, and that will depend on, on the permit that the driver has. Um, and so, you know, in, in terms of our own legislation, you know, bear in mind on the 1st of January, because we've transposed EU law, our laws are identical to EU ones. It'll take a bit of time to, to, to get ledgers of divergence. I think the bigger issue will be whether or not there's an ECTM permit. And ECTM? Was that the sorry, the... European Ministers of Conference of Transport. Conference of, of, of Ministers of Transport, Transport yeah. yeah. Uh, Transport Ministers. Um, and, and these are permits that yeah. allow drivers to um, work ac across the EU. And, you know, I think that's probably the, 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 the key issue because there are limits. There are limits to the number of permits. Um, permits have, have already been provided, but um, there's not enough, I don't think, for, for the... Um, the numbers of, of drivers that would need them. I think we do have some hauliers who their drivers go out on a Sunday somewhere in Europe, work across Europe during the week and then come in with a backload and bring it back in. Yeah. So how many drivers would we have in that position at the moment and how many permits have we been offered? Um, I don't remember the number. I don't 15 know that. percent of the permits available came to Northern Ireland. Uh, Sorry. Fifteen percent of the permits available. The application went open from the second to the twentieth of November, and fifteen percent. And I think I don't remember the exact figure, but the total was just over sixteen hundred permits were issued. So fifteen percent of sixteen hundred. And it's not enough to cover it's our our haulage sector. How many are we outstanding? I, I would need to, we need um, to check we, that. Yeah, we need to check that with the policy area in the department that is dealing with this specific issue. But we'll come back to you with the exact figures. Um, and you know, we we have made it clear again. Our, our minister has written to the Department of Transport to say that the number of permits is is not enough to cover the needs of our whole sector. So you're actually highlighting a, a real life problem today, mm -hmm. then yeah. that that some. Uh, companies will not be able to carry out their normal mm -hmm. uh, uh, routing and, and, yeah. and distribution. And in turn, that means the cost of getting some goods mm -hmm. to Northern Ireland will, will increase and getting some of our exports yeah. out. So and, uh, and how, how is that currently being addressed? Um, well, again, that's, it, it's one of the top four issues that yeah. Three to four issues that we've identified. It's, it's in the same category as the driving licences. And, and it is also clearly um, fitting into part of the negotiations. Um, so um, it's, I think it's a very difficult area. I mean, you know, the, the haulage sector operates on the basis that if, something, if a truck leaves here and goes to somewhere in Europe, it could actually pick up something and take it to another European company and then come back to, to us. And that's the business model. So the, the, the cabotage bit in the middle is, is also going to be an issue unless we can get an agreement. Um, and this is where, you know, it is frustrating that at this, this time in the year before... Well, weeks now before we leave, that we are still unclear about what the position is, um, and you know, we have made it um, very clear to the Department of Transport that that this will leave us in a very difficult position. You said this is one of the top four issues. What are the other three top four issues? Um, well, we have interbus, interbus. Um, so that that may affect passenger transport, um, certainly on, on the island of Ireland. Um, and again, we're looking at, at, at potential mitigations if there isn't an agreement. Um, there is a, an, an extension to the interbus agreement. 
um, which would need to be signed up to by at least, I think it's three EU states, member states, for it to be valid. And that's not going to happen until the end of the negotiations. So we are um, you know, sitting waiting to see, is that going to actually be agreed? Um, if it isn't, then we would need to enter into bilateral arrangements with Ireland um, to allow cross-border bus services to continue, um, uh, scheduled bus services to continue. Um, occasional ones are OK, um, because they are already covered in the interbus agreement, not the extension to the interbus agreement. Um, as I said, the driver's licences bit, um, and uh, particularly the, the, the driver's licences that have been extended. Um, and then the other one is um, general traffic disruption, which would be you know, for us to, 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 to work with the PSNI to, to deal with. Okay. That's right. No, yeah. that's right. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other member wish to make any comment at this stage? Because we will be returning to this, obviously, in detail. Chair, one, one small point, because it probably could impact on other constituencies. Like in Derry, there are 20 of the bus drivers who work for TransLink, mm -hmm. live in the south, and have a EU driving licence, and will be driving buses here. And there have been a number of them have been in contact with myself to know if on the 1st of January they can go to work. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I'm sure that, that TransLink will have... Um, been working through on a solution for that. Um, I mean, I know, for example, on, on, the, on the rail service, um, there was a, a possibility at one stage that actually the, the cross-border rail service might be impacted, but um, Northern Railways has actually set up a company in Dublin to allow it to continue to happen. Now, it's going to come at an additional cost to the mm. company, yeah. but at least the train service can continue. So, you know, as and where there um, are solutions, we've clearly been working and putting those in place. Yeah, there have been a number of companies have looked at the supply chain and looked yeah. at the size of the supply chain. It's the chain same with the hauliers, actually. So, yeah. you know, some haulage companies yeah. have now set up um, companies, companies in the south. Yeah. down south to get over the licensing issues that they might have. Um, so, you know, the, the private sector uh, can often be more nimble than you know, the public sector in terms of sorting things out. You know, they, they don't have to go through a legislative process to, to set up a company down south. You know, they, they do that. Um, uh, but I think it will come at an, an additional cost. Mr. Boyden? Yeah, thanks, Chair. I appreciate the understanding of it and the explanation. But, I mean, to be fair, so, some of them, they might seem a big issue, but they're not... In terms of the interbus travelling, it mm -hmm. makes common sense in terms of an economic model for the whole of the island. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, if it's in east west, it doesn't make any difference either. But the, the point, obviously, at some point, we as a committee will have to look into those issues. The the cabotage is, is definitely an issue, mm -hmm. a big mm -hmm. issue. And I mean, if, if we're to support our holidays, we definitely need to look at that. Yeah. But but this framework to me is an operational framework. How are we going to? Yeah. That's what it is. If we need to change policy or legislation, that um, I, I, I would, I would, I would like to chair. I definitely would ask the question in relation to operator license. Everything those were standards set, high standards set. It mm -hmm. should be in any country, mm -hmm. and I don't think any member here would have. Mm -hmm. I mean, from a committee point of view, you know, I don't think we would have any issues with that. To be perfectly honest, I mean, those standards are set to protect both the operator and others. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, so. Just, just to say, yeah, the, the point is appreciated, but it's a job of workforce. But I do say this: it's an operational framework, and the private industry and business out there is well ahead of the game, mm -hmm. and they're looking to us mm -hmm. on the first of January. Yeah. I know we will roll out our own normal government, whatever structures, whatever the departments have to roll out. But people are going to be coming to us asking questions, and we need to hit the ground running with it, and we're going to face big challenges. There's no doubt about it. Thank you, okay. Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you all for okay. coming thank this you. morning, and we'll return to this in the new year. Yeah, no, thank that's great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you, and have a safe, have a happy Christmas. Enjoy. We'll see you in the new year. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Okay, members, just just to um, progress this, are, are you content that um, the clerk writes to corresponding committees in the devolved? Um, and the other devolved administrations, and also um, 
House of Lords, House of Commons, just in relation to their deliberations. Chair, I can't hear. I'm asking if members are content that the clerk writes to corresponding committees in the other devolved regions and also the House of Lords, House of Commons, um, with regards to their deliberations and their approach to the common frameworks that we have looked at today. Are we content to do that? Great. Um, I, th I think you need to add uh, the Leinster House to that list because the third principle of the common framework is north south as well as east west. And we and the TEO committee mm -hmm. have had, yeah, well, we had Cathy. Uh -huh. It does make relevance and it does make sense to do all of the institutions, not just the east west. We had, for instance, the TEO committee. We've had representation from the House of Lords and we've also spoke to the EU um, Foreign Affairs Committee in the in Leinster House in relation to these matters as well. So there's work that they are doing, we've talked about today, that would be relevant here. The House of Lords, just for information, is carrying out an inquiry into the common framework, so it may be useful to speak to them. We spoke to them last week. Well, obviously, in our, okay. in our parks, there's a correspondence from the House of Lords just in relation to hazardous substances, and they do have concerns about planned engagement. They do. And uh, have emphasised I have emphasised that going forward, and I think probably in our communication with the Minister, I think we probably need to say that as well, that that's important to do. I'd also like, if members are content, that we write to the Minister just in relation to how this engagement goes forward and the timeliness of receiving briefings and papers. Great. Great. Okay, moving then, item 12, which has been cancelled for the record, um, that was a departmental briefing in January Mondering. Moving then to item 13, which is our forward work programme, um, and that is at page 220. Um, at the committee, when the, our next meeting is being held on the 13th of January, but unfortunately that day we have to end at noon. Um, so if members are content, given the fact that we've had two, two briefings um, it's cancelled on us today with regards to January monitoring and also with regards to taxis that we tried to reschedule those for the 13th yeah. of January. Sure. But that yeah, also please. leaves us with regard with the hazardous waste framework. Now, we, I suppose we have a couple of approaches with regard to that because obviously if we are writing to, to the other regions, um, we may want to, to wait um, to get some, to okay. some papers back from them before scheduling, but I'd also like to see if members are content to have a little bit of flexibility around this, in that we will have a busy programme moving forward, um, that we may have to schedule an additional meeting, and if we are going to schedule an additional meeting, that we may use that opportunity to look at these frameworks. Yeah. Yeah. Agree. Are you content to do that? Now, because the meeting's finishing at noon on the 13th, um, I'm going to suggest, if members are content, that we then move to another room and have an informal sort of mini strategy time for about two hours, um, so that we can discuss um, any of the, the work that we want to do in, in up until Easter recess. Yep. Okay. And so, Lucha. Yep. Great. Great. Okay. So, um, any other business? Good luck with the minister. Some of this. Um, just to remind you that there, uh, there's obviously a photograph with TransLink at the apron with the hydrogen bus, and obviously before I close the meeting, obviously wish you all a happy Christmas. Um, ensure that you social distance as you leave, and the next meeting will take place at 10 a.m. Wednesday, the 13th of January, in room 29. Okay. And um, just also note that due to recess, the pack will not issue until the afternoon of the 11th of January. Thank you. And I now propose that we adjourn. Thank you. Thank okay. you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed.